Do we have like refresh here today? Refresh? Did you love phase or no? Yeah. yeah. They can later today or later this week? Later today. And they stay through when? Thursday. So it's Thursday they might come to class. Is that right? Do they stay through? Maybe. Okay. So probably not. So Wednesday is the big day on campus. So I was asked if I could look at that pre on the class, and of course I said yes, because, you know, we're all for us. For God, for country, and for Yale, and we have to have them. So I prepared some remarks to try to sort of try to articulate what I think is so distinctive about this wonderful university of ours, and just to spend two minutes on it.
which is an important topic that I think you could spend a whole semester with you and not spend any time on, on, on health insurance. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and the ACA, the Obamacare Act. Um, and, but then we're going to segue halfway through to talk a little bit about a number of interventions, a kind of potpourri, a set of illustrations of the kinds of public health interventions one might consider doing. Now we've seen some of that before. We've talked a little bit about, we've talked about obesity and smoking and, and uh, drug, uh, uh, guns. We've talked a little bit about the kinds of interventions one might implement. Today we're going to look at that again and sort of do some extensions on that. Uh, last time we discussed the possible implications of biotechnology and other advances for human health. We summarized the still unresolved debate between Sendell and Harris regarding what they thought about some of these developments. I alluded to, but I didn't assign any readings for it, or we might give you a formal presentation about uh, Jay Hughes's argument in a wonderful book called Citizen Cyborg uh, about the hand in hand nature of technology advancements and democracy uh, for human welfare. Uh, Hughes is very concerned with how a rich get richer dynamic as we invent new technologies and how might there be a kind of democratic control over some of these very dramatic and potentially dangerous uh, technologies. We talked a little bit about the practical and moral problems raised by situations at the boundary between life and death, between people and animals, uh, and between people and machines. And today we're going to be talking about uh, whether people have insurance in the United States, whether it makes a difference to have insurance, how it might make a difference, and what sorts of other sorts of interventions we might try uh, to improve health. Uh, any questions on this stuff so far? So uh, this is the results of the midterm. You guys did much better on this midterm than on the last one. It makes me very happy. I think people were studying. Um, so, uh, so the mean uh, it was 89. The mean grade was 89, and the median was 92. So you know, 50 percent of you were above 92, which is really uh, reassuring uh, to me. Uh, yeah, so I want to quickly do some logistics on the exam. We're honing in on the procedures for the exam. This is uh, my first time administering it at Yale, so I'm getting to understand the schedule and other constraints. So let me let me just tell you. First of all, regardless of what I say today, the correct procedure will be the final procedure that's posted on the course website. Okay? So if there's any inconsistency with what I say today, we'll post on the course website the course website uh, rules. Once again, it will be a take-home, open book, open note. We won't require you to do any extra reading or expect it, although you're free to do it. Uh, except we might assign you an article as part of a question. In fact, there will be a couple of questions that have read this article and then do the following. Uh, you have to work on your own. Do not collaborate with others. Please don't plagiarize anyone else or any sources. We use electronic methods to check stuff. If several do copy from the same study notes or the same source or from each other, it will be detected. Uh, the exam will be broadly synthetic with the entire course. It will be a, it'll require 14 to 16 pages double spaced with the cross both questions. <coughs> There'll be some choice, there'll be two pairs of questions, we get one pair of care, and we'll blindly grade it by the TFs. Your section TF will review it, I'll review it. We're completely committed to fair uh, grading uh, in the class, fair and kind grading. Uh, we're going to post the exam on the course website at 5 o'clock on Thursday. You'll have something like 10 days to do it, which should be plenty of time, especially if my class is one of five or four that you're taking. Um, uh, we're going to have very specific turn-in requirements, which are required for a class this size. You must deliver a hard copy to Sam Southgate, in the lab, uh, who's the head TF, in the lobby of 17 Hill House on Sunday, May the 4th. Okay? Now, Sam is going to have a booth set up in the lobby from 10 to 12. Do not just simply drop your exam off. You have to wait until Sam or one of the other TFs checks you off the spreadsheet, acknowledging that we've received your exam. And you have to wait until your name is checked off the list. We will not accept late exams. Don't come at 1 o'clock, the booth will be gone. Uh, we're going to provide you an additional drop-off earlier. So if you can't come Sunday between 10 and 2, we're going to have uh, Saturday, May the 3rd. It says 5 to 6 there. I think it'll be 5.30 to 6.30. So the precise time we haven't fixed yet. But Saturday afternoon, you can also come. You don't have to come yourself. If your roommate wants you want to sit, if you trust your roommate to turn your exam, uh, and you want to have someone else deliver your exam, that's totally fine. But the person must say, I'm here to deliver Susie's exam, name checked off, off that person goes. In addition to that, okay, you must upload an electronic version of your exam. And you can do that after you turn in the hard copy, but it has to be the same, okay? Because we're going to read the hard copy. So if you make any changes afterwards, uh, you're not going to get any benefit. Uh, put the same copy online as you uh, load it, and you can do that until 5 o'clock on May the 4th. 
Uh, if any of this poses a hardship of any kind, and you want to turn your exam even earlier for some reason, email stamps outdated. We'll see if we can make alternative arrangements. And finally, we're going to circulate, I think, there'll be very specific directions you need to follow when you turn in your exam, like put your name here and staple it this way and paper clip it that way. Please follow those instructions. Any questions on the logistics of the exam? Yeah. In terms of Victoria, right? Yes. And Any format you want, so long as you actually you can put footnotes, you can put endnotes, you can put MLA citations, citations out, just cite, okay? And I think we say that the citations don't count in the page limit if you don't, if you want to have a seven pages of writing and an eight page of citation, that's fine. Put it at the bottom. If you want to pad it out your link, you can put it at the bottom and fiddle with the fonts and margins or whatever tricks you attempt to implement. <laughs> Any questions on this? Then, you know, uh, the federal grants have a very strict deadline, a very strict guidelines for length. The federal grants, like, like bureaucratic standards of like half inch margins, 11.5 uh, font, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And many years ago, I discovered, I was told by someone else that if you take all the periods in your 20 page proposal, you guys know this trick? Yeah. Yeah. And you reduce the periods to like 10 point font, you can gain all this length, you know? So, yeah, we know those tricks. What? You make a very good figure. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so uh, years and years ago, I worked when I was a medical student. I, uh, I worked with Mass Mental. I was at Harvard Medical School, and the uh, the uh, mental hospital there was Mass Mental. And that was Mass Mental. Actually, that was closing at the time. Anyway, I was on a psych ward, and one of our patients was uh, was a former um, psychiatrist. And she had a very thick uh, Eastern European accent, which I can't possibly do justice. But whenever we would try to help her in any way, she would go, I'm a psychotherapist. I know your tricks. And uh, <laughs> I feel like that. I'm a lifelong student. I know these tricks. <laughs> OK, questions about the exam? Other questions? OK. OK, so, um, so let's talk a little bit about insurance, and then let's talk about some cooler kinds of uh, interventions one might do to intervene in our, <coughs> in our society. It's actually fairly shocking to realize that until very recently, a very large fraction of our population, 46 million Americans, lacked health insurance, and that number was actually rising. And this is completely different from every other industrialized democracy. We are actually, I think, unique in the world in how screwed up our healthcare system is. And this fact, the fact that we had so many uninsured, coupled with a manifest inefficiency and inequity in the system we had, prompted the passage of health care reform four years ago that is finally beginning to make a dent in some of these numbers of uninsured individuals. Now, it's also really important when we speak about this that you, you realize some other very simple fact that's lost typically in the debate about public insurance, which is that uh, since the 1960s, every American older than 65 has been on public insurance. The Medicare program has covered 96% of the elderly for decades, okay? A single-payer system run by the government has been in place in this country for people older than 65 for decades. So to the extent we're talking about so-called Obamacare or the ACA Act, uh, it's not a radical departure from something we've had for decades uh, in this country. So if you're older than 65, you have been insured in this country with very few exceptions, 96% of the people uh, for a very long time. Um, so the data that we're discussing here today pertain to adults between the ages 19 and 64. And whether such an adult has insurance depends very much uh, on their income. So, um, so, uh, so this shows uh, old data now. 46 million Americans were uninsured about a, a decade ago. That was still the case up until uh, about four years ago when the AC Act was still passed. Here's the percentage of adults without insurance. This shows that they're uninsured now in blue, or we're, or we're insured now, but had a period of uninsurance in the last year. Um, and if you look, for example, at the total uh, percentage in 2005, about 28% of Americans were either uninsured or had had a period of uninsurance in the previous year. Um, but this, of course, not surprisingly, varies according to income. So the poor, 53% uh, of them lacked insurance uh, altogether or had not had it in the past year. Whereas, of course, the very, or not the very rich, the well, better off, uh, maybe that affected 7% uh, of the population. But interestingly, most people who lack health insurance actually are employed. All right? So for example, if you look at 
uh, the adult work status of people who were, uh, un who were in uninsured, half of them had a full-time job, but still did not have insurance. Uh, and 15% uh, of them had a full-time job, and a third of them uh, were not currently employed. And if you look at their family more generally, you found that two-thirds of them, two-thirds of the uninsured, were either working themselves or had someone in their family who was actually employed. And it was data like this that suggested to policy analysts prior to the passage of the ACA Act that the workplace might be a feasible venue to provide insurance. Now, as Cutler argues in his book, which was assigned for today, the, 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 um, the uh, sort of uh, workplace is not necessarily the most efficient or ideal um, uh, venue to, to deal with this social problem of uh, uninsurance. But it's not a bad thing. It's a feasible thing. Bureaucracy exists to track workers and so forth. Maybe we can use it as a way in to provide insurance to the public. And that kind of idea, plus the fact that, gee, two-thirds of the insured had a job or had a family member had a job, suggests that actually maybe we could somehow couple or require worker, uh, employers to add insurance to the workers. Maybe that would help fix the problem, and then maybe we wouldn't have to provide you know, state insurance or expand Medicare to cover everyone uh, even below uh, 65. And not surprisingly, lacking insurance results in a significant reduction in the access to health care. Not health, necessarily, but access to health care. So if you look at uh, a percent of adults in, this, in adults in this age group reporting the following problems in the past year because of costs, uh, did not fill a prescription, 18% reported a problem because of costs if they were insured the whole year, 43% if they were uninsured. Okay? So not being insured means you don't fill your prescriptions. It means you don't much more li or much less likely to see a specialist when needed. It means you're much more likely to skip a medical test, a treatment, or a follow-up. It means that you may have had a problem and didn't see a doctor. So half of the uninsured reported having a problem but never seeing a doctor for it because of their own insurance as compared to 15% who had insurance. So even sometimes if you're insured, you may have a problem, choose not to see a doctor, maybe 15% of people might do that, but actually many more additional people would like to see a doctor and are unable to, as highlighted by the between those two figures. And if you across, sum across all of them, you see that maybe two thirds or 60% uh, have some kind of access problems, to access to healthcare problems as a result of not having insurance. Now, of course, by now in the class, you should know that there could be confounding factors associated both with not having health insurance and with not seeking medical care. You might be the kind of person or have some attributes that make you neither want or have insurance and also make you not want to seek medical care. And, and if that's the case, that's a different kind of problem. In addition, by this point in the class, we should also be quite unsure quite unsure about whether medical care is the crucial determinant of health regardless, right? We, uh, we may not be the case, actually, that giving people insurance and increasing access to medical care necessarily improves their health or improves it as much as it might be improved with other kinds of policy interventions we might implement. And in fact, as I mentioned, the United States is not is not only unusual in its lack of public health insurance uh, for all, uh, but also very backward. All of these European countries had compulsory health insurance, uh, some for over 100 years. So Germany introduces it in 1883, Austria and Hungary in 1888, Luxembourg in 1901, Norway in 1909, Serbia, for the love of God, 1910, <laughs> Serbia has uh, public health insurance, and here we are 100 years later finally getting our act together. 1911, Britain, Russia, Switzerland, the Irish Free State, France, Romania, Estonia gets its act together in 1912. Here we are 100 years later. Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, etc., etc. Even Greece, 1922, introduces some kind of public health insurance scheme for the entire uh, public. So really, we are, compared to all of these other countries, quite uh, backward when it comes to the way we think about providing access to health care and reimbursement for health care in our uh, society. And a number of solutions to this problem have been suggested. This has included, as I already mentioned, and as Cutler discusses, the idea of extending workplace insurance. Look, lots of, many of the uninsured are already working. Let's just somehow work in that current system we have and try to expand that system. Uh, implementing a single payer system, people saying, look, we already have a single payer system for the elderly. Let's expand that, push it down to cover people at a younger age. 
or provide some kind of an alternative scheme, a kind of pub or public pool with mandatory uh, enrollment. And it's true that a single payer system will lack some competition and may have other features, such as bureaucracy, or rules and constraints, that might possibly be problematic. But as I've already mentioned, we already have Medicare, which is a single payer system, and it does seem to work. So, and it's also the case that having a single payer might make it might have other advantages, such as making it possible to incentivize quality and drive down administrative waste. All right? So there are ways in which having a single payer is a very powerful to negotiate with providers to drive down costs and minimize like duplicative efforts. Like right now, if you have one type of insurance card, you could have multiple different forms, different paperwork, different kinds of ways of accessing the healthcare system, whether you see a doctor in one state or another, whether you see a hospital or a doctor, whether you go to a clinic. It's an enormous variety of bureaucracies that come to bear. You know, if we standardize that, we might save a ton of money. And Cutler, in your reading, proposes a solution that tries to meld the best elements of both the single payer and market competition. And he argues that this will align incentives and help improve the quality of care. And finally, he argues that health insurance is not something that is necessarily made better by tying into employment. So why do that, he asks. You know, it's not necessarily, yes, it's a way of approaching the problem, but it's not necessarily the best way. So why not do something else, he asks. Well, the PDACA, the kind of uh, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare of 2010, finally started to address these chronic problems uh, in our country. And this act is quite complex, and it reflects a number of political realities, and it was not perfect, but it's not bad either. Um, it seems to address, or will address over the coming few years, quite a number of problems that have plagued our country for quite a long time. It has a number of features. This is just a high-level summary. It's like hundreds of pages of the act. But at a high level, it requires citizens and legal immigrants to have insurance. It creates state-based American health benefit exchanges through which individuals can buy coverage and has complex incentives to incentivize them to participate. It has an individual mandate that's incentivized by a penalty, um, which we'll come to in a moment why that kind of is necessary. It requires employers to provide coverage and also gives them complex incentives. And it expands Medicaid and Medicare in certain ways. So it kind of does a little bit of everything that was shown on the previous slide. It expands Medicare, which is our program for the elderly and the disabled. Medicaid, which is our program for people in poverty and also uh, children, poor children. It uh, sort of encourages employers to expand how they provide health care coverage. It provides a kind of state-based, the last kind of, uh, as many states are opting out of it, not many, but some, to the detriment of their own citizens, uh, are opting out of it. But nevertheless, it provides a kind of scheme to provide private insurance or personal insurance to a number of individu individuals and a complex set of incentives to kind of try to get everyone to behave uh, properly. And as all of you surely know, that in order to get insurance to work, the whole point of insurance is to distribute risk. We don't want only the ill to buy insurance, obviously. We don't want people not to buy insurance and then simply impose their costs on us anyway, which is what actually happens. So right now, it's even if you're quote uninsured, let's say you're uninsured because you're poor or because you're foolish or because you think you're healthy, you choose not to get insurance. But you're hit by a bus or you're stricken by lightning or you get some kind, of, kind of, some kind of catastrophic illness, or even not catastrophic illness, what you typically will do is you'll still show up in our emergency rooms. And because we are a civilized society by and large, we do not turn you away when you show up at our hospitals. We still take care of you, right? And those costs of taking care of you are borne by someone else, not by you. So you impose externalities if you are in one of those categories who are, choose not to get it, or think you're well, or think you don't need it, and those costs are then shifted on to the society as a whole. Yeah, in fact. Uh, professor, uh, the emergency treatment, um, is that legally required? Yes. So you have to stabilize the patient. The law requires, if you come in with a knife in your chest, and I ask you, do you have insurance? And then you say no, and I say, okay, I'll be going to die. That's not what happens, nor is it the kind of society you would want. So the hospitals are required to provide stabilizing care, and then they can transfer you somewhere else, for example, to a county hospital, which, uh, which is supported by tax dollars and provides care to indigent people or uninsured people in the community. So one way or the other, your care. Now this doesn't mean you get great care. It doesn't mean you get rapid care. It doesn't mean you get elective care, because you wouldn't. If you showed up in a non-emergency situation and said, gee, you know, I'd like 
you know, take a look at my my vision is blurry. Can you do something about it? You wouldn't necessarily get the carry. Yeah, Rachel. I was just thinking, like, if you do go to the ER and you don't have insurance, don't you? Is that like usually just unbilled to you? Yes, they can try to build it, but now we imagine that you're 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 impoverished. Yeah. Right? Or you're like you, you're 23 and you go there and you don't have insurance. You're working for a startup, it doesn't provide insurance, and you think I'm healthy, I'm fit, I go running in marathons, and uh, all of a sudden you get leukemia. Uh, then what happens? Now, uh, Obamacare requires an uh, extended period of time during which you could be covered under your parents' care, but not indefinitely. Maybe you don't get along with your parents. Maybe you don't want to be dependent on your parents. Uh, maybe you forget for your parents to add to you. Or maybe you're 26 and you're not even 23. You're right on the margin, in the prime of your life, and something bad happens to you. So, um, so you don't have insurance. Yeah, you go to the go to seek care. And what happens? And now the problem, of course, is once you seek care, you're very expensive. Uh, to care for. Much better to require all 26 year olds to pay a few hundred dollars or something. And there's also a difference between, and this is very important, different philosophical stances about insurance in general from a policy point of view, and also frankly from your own point of view, like as you grow up as adults and think about what you can afford to lose and what you cannot. Most people are willing and able to bear a risk of the loss of a few thousand dollars, all right, or willing and able to pay for their own wellness. What most of us cannot afford is when our child needs a heart transplant. Right? Then it's ruinous. It's ruinous. So, um, so you can, you, we can imagine a scheme which provided catastrophic insurance for 26-year-olds that wouldn't cost very much. Only one in a thousand or one in 10,000 26-year-olds will need care that costs half a million dollars. You can do the arithmetic and figure out, gee, if everyone pays five bucks a year or 20 bucks a year, we'll be able to provide that kind of care on an occasional basis. The numbers are all made up, but you get the, the basic principle. Other questions? Um, so, um, anyway, so these are at a very high level the kinds of features that are in part of the uh, ACA uh, Act. And here's how the Act is forecast to affect the problem of the uninsured. On the left, there are 162 million people in the employer market. So on the left shows insurance coverage that would have occurred in 2019 if there had been no reform. And here's what is predicted to happen given the reform. So on the left, there were 162 people who were in the employer market, 54 million people who were uninsured, 35 million people who were on Medicaid, and 30 million people in a non-group other market. And this contains not just the individual market, but certain small public plans. And so here on the right, you have, uh, you have the uninsured in green, this uh, group right there. And here's what happens. Uh, this is what would have happened if we had to pass that. Here's what's happening afterwards. So there's a significant reduction in the green bit, but not an elimination, okay? So the ACA Act did not eliminate the problem of the uninsured, but it made a significant uh, uh, dent in it. And on the right now, you have 159 million Americans on the employer market, 44 million on Medicaid, 25 million in the non-group other market, 24 million in the exchanges. You may be hearing that we have about six, seven, eight million people who already signed up for the exchanges. This forecast will go up to about 24 million. And only, quote unquote, only 22 million left uninsured uh, is forecast in, in a few years. And this uninsured category has gone from being the second largest category to the smallest category. And though there's no public option, there are a lot more people eligible for public programs on the right. So the population that remains of the uninsured will be far reduced, and the remaining group who are uninsured will be primarily composed of the following types of people illegal immigrants. Still won't be covered. Um, the few people who can't afford their insurance and aren't getting subsidies to help them purchase it, there's like some people right on the border who are adversely, you know, can't, can't afford it themselves but don't get the subsidies necessary, and people who decided to pay the penalty rather than purchase insurance. So some people say, hell with that, I don't want to be insured, I don't want to buy insurance, I'm going to pay the penalty, and I'll remain uninsured. Yeah, uh, Neil. Um, I was just wondering, is this forecast? Um, Assuming that all the states adopt the reforms, or I don't actually know whether this particular forecast, which comes from, um, which is uh, comes from a couple of years ago now, in the midst of the implementation, um, took into account the likelihood that not all states would, would adopt. The states that haven't so far tend to have smaller populations, so I don't think it's going to make a big dent in it. But for the people in those states, I think Kansas and Oklahoma, for instance, they're definitely going to be adversely affected. Yeah. Um, is the penalty more so? No, it's less, uh, less expensive than buying insurance. Yeah, I mean, if we, then it would, it would be an incentive. It would, it would 
you know, to do. It costs more to pay the penalty than to pay insurance. Why do you do that? Well, because we're trying to strike a balance between the kind of authoritarian approach and, uh, and the libertarian approach. It's pretty hard. Either extreme doesn't make much sense. You know, we, we have no consequences if you don't buy insurance. We need to provide some incentives uh, to get people to do it. Plus, we need to get the cost fairly more, like any other tax, right, that we impose on anybody. So somehow it has to be distributed in our society. We have a democratic process which came up with this cockamamie uh, scheme. Like I said, it's not perfect, but it's not so bad. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, if, you, if your income is right near the boundary of the threshold, right above it, you might not be able to get the subsidy, but still not feel like you have enough money to be able to buy the insurance. You might make complicated judgments on your own. Plus, there's going to be some churn in the system. You think you're insured for your spouse, then your spouse loses her job. You don't mind up signing up for your own thing. You know, it's kind of a moving uh, target. And with 300 million people, there will be lots of people who are one category or another. Yeah. I think you're starting to get at this point in New York. Um, but for the first graph you showed us, why was there such a small change for somebody who didn't have insurance and then got it? Why did that number decrease more for like the rate which takes on a specialist or for like the treat that restriction? Yeah, it, it only the right, so if they were insured but weren't insured in the past, why is it still such a happen? I'm sorry, help me understand what the question is. For the light blue mark? Yeah, is it in, this, in this one here, here for instance, yeah. So not much difference between, so this goes back over the last year or so, this is, these are indistinguishable. Whether you're uninsured now or uninsured at any point in the last year, you're unable to get it. You have some problem with access to health care. You're saying why is it even worse for those that are uninsured now? <laughs> okay, maybe I'm missing the people in the light blue condition do have insurance. Uh, yes, they're insured now, but they weren't at some point in the past year. They weren't insured, and presumably this is integrated across time. So at some point in the past year, yeah. Right, right. I mean, they do this because really, what you could do is you could just drop the clear lines and just look at the light blue lines and compare people who ever were uninsured in the last year continuously insured. But they also try to do an instantaneous estimate by looking at the insured now. Other questions? Uh, but still, we must remember one of the key things that we've been seeing throughout the course, which is that this may not make much of a difference to health per se at all, whether you're insured or not. Having insurance does increase the use of medical care, and the financial details of the kind of insurance you have influence how much medical care you get. But whether that improves your health or not, by now you should be a little bit skeptical, okay, as to whether actually more health care gives you more health at the population level for sure, and perhaps even at the individual level. Uh, and we know this, we know this in part from a very famous experiment, the Rand Health Insurance Experiment, that was conducted in the 1970s. It is similar to the Baker meeting which was assigned for today. But the Rand Health Insurance Experiment was conducted in the 1970s, and it involved 2,000 non-elderly families in various locations around the country. And these families were randomly assigned to get various kinds of health insurance. Okay, we took these 2,000 families, and we randomly assigned them to different kinds of health insurance, and one group was re even randomly assigned to free medical care. And not surprisingly, the more people had to pay for their own care, the less they used it. Okay? So here are the three plans that people could get. The care was free, they had to pay for 25% of the cost, 50% of the cost, or 95% of the cost of their health care. And, uh, and now let's look at what happens to in-person visits. So when hair, care is free, People on average go to 4.5, uh, I think this is an annualized number, 4.5 times they see the doctor per year, whereas if they have to pay 95% of the cost, they go to 2.73 doctor visits per year. This is total hospital admissions. Now this number varies less from 1.28 hospital admissions if the care is free to 0 0.99 hospital admissions if it's, it's free. Uh, and these numbers are basically distinguishable. Why might that be? Why might there be more variation here than there is here? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's much less discretionary. People are much less likely to say, you know, I'm kind of bored. Let me go to the hospital and get some health care delivered to me. Or I'm a little worried about myself. I really want to check into the hospital. But they are much more worried, more willing and able at the margin to go see a doctor. Exactly. 
So here, you can see the likelihood of any healthcare use varies according to whether it's free. And here are the total expenses in 1991 dollars that are incurred by, uh, according to these uh, uh, plans. So when you put people at risk for their financial risk for their own healthcare consumption, not surprisingly, classic economics, uh, it, it declines. So people are less likely to use healthcare when they have to pay for more of it themselves. Well, we just saw that when cost sharing is higher, the use of medical care is lower. But the question is, were the people who use more medical care the better for it? Did facilitating people's access to health care by giving them better kinds of insurance improve their health as measured in a variety of ways? So here's some health measures. And here are people who are on the free plan, free medical care, and here are people who are on some cost sharing plan. So the physical function score, which is a total measure of how well you are, no difference after a number of years in the two. Mental health score, no difference. Smoking, probability of being a smoker, no difference whether you have free care or not. Your weight, no difference. Your cholesterol level, no difference. Your diastolic blood pressure, maybe slightly lower in the free plan. Maybe a little bit lower blood pressure in the free plan. Your vision, uh, slightly lower in the free plan, maybe because you get glasses in the free plan and you don't get them uh, otherwise. Uh, and risk of dying, basically uh, indistinguishable. So only these two were statistically significant, the blood pressure and the vision uh, decrease. So this large scale, very famous experiment in which people were randomly assigned different kinds of insurance showed that with certain kinds of insurance, more healthcare is sought by the people, but alas, was unable to document that that seeking of healthcare improved the health of the people who were uh, getting it. So we must note that having insurance is not a panacea. Even those in our country, the elderly on Medicare, for example, who have insurance often do not get valuable treatments. So one possible explanation for this is, yes, you had insurance, yes, you saw the doctor, but you weren't actually getting effective medical care. You weren't actually getting what you really needed. So once again, you must understand that access to medical care, let alone the proper use of medical care, should not be conflated with having insurance. Right? So when you hear debates in the coming years about access to health care, access can mean do you have insurance? Access can mean, regardless of whether you have insurance, can you see a doctor? And access can mean, regardless of the foregoing, are you actually getting proper care? Are you being cared for in an effective or good way? Now, a more recent natural experiment addressed the same topics and was in your reading. The ACA expanded Medicaid coverage for low-income adults, but the likely effects of expanding the coverage were unclear. But in uh, 2008, Medicaid was expanded in Oregon based on lottery drawings from a waiting list, and this provided an opportunity to evaluate these effects. So about two years after the lottery, data from over 6,000 adults who were randomly selected to apply for the coverage were compared to about 6,000 adults who were not selected. And the two groups were compared those that were randomly selected to get a kind of public insurance, Medicaid, and those that were excluded, who didn't get that, who were otherwise chosen at random. And the, uh, and the study found limited effects on physical health, but notable effects on mental health, health care use, and financial circumstances. So this shows the Oregon, this was in the reading, the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment, effects on health, health care, and wealth. These are selected outcomes picked from all the various results. And if you look at, this is the mean value of the control group, and then this is the change in the treatment group, the group that got the insurance, compared to the control group. So uh, blood pressure was lower, but statistically insignificantly so in the treated group compared to the control group. Cholesterol level, no difference that was detectable. Glycosylated, glycosylated hemoglobin in diabetics, no difference that was detectable. Depression, however, was significantly less likely. Nine percentage point drop in depression, which was statistically significant in those that got the insurance compared to those that did not. Uh, uh, health quality of life rating improved in one year uh, was significantly improved by seven points out of 100 in the insured group. Uh, out of pocket spending uh, was $215 less in the insured group. Any medical debt, much less likely. Uh, remember, we've talked about how illnesses are financially ruinous to Americans, like they would be to you or even to your families. 
So most of you come from families that, no matter how rich they are, a, a single illness can be financially ruinous, can bankrupt the family if you're not insured. Uh, and in fact, that they found that there was a significant reduction in, um, in, uh, in, in medical debt if you could provide a kind of social safety net. Prescription drugs, uh, not surprisingly, people were more likely to get prescriptions uh, if they were uh, uh, on the insurance plan. Office visits uh, went up a little bit if you were on the insurance plan. And receiving the judgment of the patients, all needed care uh, was significantly higher in those that had insurance. So in this study that you were assigned, what the study, scientists were able to discern was those randomly assigned to get insurance had better mental health, more health care use, and lower financial, adverse financial impacts, but they weren't able to document an impact on physical health for some of the measures that they had. Now this may partly be because the measures they had were only like two-year measures, no blood pressure and cholesterol. Maybe if they could look at something else, maybe if they had a longer follow-up, survival or something like that, they might be able to detect an effect. So and it's unclear, in fact, whether long-term effects would be different, which they well might be, or whether in such a poor population, the real threat to health is something else altogether, something other than access to medical care, as we've been repeatedly seeing during this course. So maybe what's killing the poor is being poor, not specifically access or use of modern healthcare services. So what can be done to increase quality of care uh, in our society and improve the healthcare that we deliver? To follow up one of Cutler's arguments, about how to best align incentives to maximize quality, perhaps we should align incentives between providers and payers and patients by returning money to patients if the treatments don't work. So one idea, and a very old one it turns out, is to pay providers only if the patient gets better. This is what Cutler describes as paying for quality, and he and many others have advocated this, and, they, and, and, if, and in fact, if you carry it to its logical extreme, paying for quality, you would only prove, you would only pay for proven success. What if I only paid hospitals or doctors if you were cured? My God, that would align incentives for the hospitals and doctors to take better care of them, right? They would only get paid if you were cured, and they did not have to see, well, I took care of 100 patients, 50 of them will not be cured through no fault of mine, I'm gonna take that hit, but the other 50 will be cured because of my efforts. How do I price that service so that I align, I'm really trying hard to cure you because that's when I make uh, my money. This is an old idea, uh, so feel better or your money back. This is uh, from patent medicine 100 years ago. All headaches instantly cured or money refunded. Legal guarantee. Uh, this is Emerson's Bromo Seltzer, uh, the most successful, I don't want to fall off here, medical care myself. The most successful American remedy in an effervescent powder taken in water. If three doses do not cure any headache, no matter how caused, send the bottle to us same were obtained, and we will at once refund the price, trial bottle, blah, blah, blah. So, and this is actually a very old idea. Uh, here's a contract between a patient and a doctor from Genoa in 1254. A legal contract that was signed. In the name of the Lord, amen. I, Rogero de Bruges of Padamo, promise and agree with you, Basso the Wool Carter, to return you to health and to make you improve from the illness that you have in your person, that is in your hand, foot, and mouth, in good faith, with the help of God, within the next month and a half. In such a way, now look, we get specific. Well, how am I going to be better? Uh, 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 Basso wants to know. Uh, Rogerio, what are you going to do for me? Well, in such a way that you will be able to feed yourself with your hand, and cut bread, and wear shoes, and walk and speak much better than you do now. Probably, actually, uh, Basso had a stroke, judging from this description of this contract. Not able to feed himself, not able to walk well, can't speak so well. Almost certainly had a left hemisphere spirit stroke. Um, I shall, I, Rogerio, shall take care of all the expenses that will be necessary for this. And at that, and at that time, you shall pay me seven Genoese lira, and you will, shall not eat any fruit, beef, or pasta in Italy, whether boiled or dry. Why does it be dry pasta? I don't know. Or cabbage. Um, if I do not keep my promises to you, you will not have to give me anything. Very specific. And I, the aforementioned Basso, promise to you, Rogerio, to pay you seven Genoese lira within three days after my recovery and improvement. Very specific contract. Actually, it's not that bad to take if you're Rogerio because six weeks, well, I don't know, touch and go, but he can improve on his own. 
Uh, nowadays, we're still patient with the physical therapy, uh, you know, but that's pretty much about it. Yes, in fact. Professor, might one of the consequences be that doctors will be disinclined to accept patients they know they might not get? Yes, 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 exactly. So, in one, exactly right. In fact, I write about this in another book I've written. Uh, that actually, what would happen then is doctors would practice a kind of discriminatory selection where they would only operate on patients that they were sure to, to cure. And you'd only get the marginal patients that would be taken in uh, practicing a kind of triage, actually, which is often done, as you know, in the battle. Yeah. Um, also, what is another issue would be is this uh, question of whether or not the patient is adhering to the treatment, which we looked at earlier. That if yes. patients are less likely to adhere to treatment. Yeah, but presumably patients are incentivized. Yes, that would be a problem. So you agree to pay me money if I fix you, and then I tell you do A, B, and C, and then you fail to do A, B, and C, and then I don't get paid. That's kind of a bummer for me. But usually you're incentivized to do A, B, and C. But yes, this could be a problem, especially for complex treatment. Now, as I'm actually illustrating both of your points, one of the ways that this has been, uh, here's some more recent examples from a broad range of conditions that people have tried. The no cure, no pay proposal. So in 1994, Merck offered refunds to patients who had been prescribed finasteride if they required surgery for benign prostatic hyperplasia after a year of treatment. Uh, Sandoz, a year later, introduced a money-back guarantee for clozapine for treating resistant schizophrenia. That's pretty cool. Uh, 1998, Merck promised to refund prescription costs in simvastatin plus diet did not help lower LDL cholesterol to target concentrations identified by doctors. So lots of pharmaceutical companies are offering these money-back guarantees. It's not just, you know, Bromo seltzer from 100 years ago. Then in 2004, Novartis launched a no-cure, no-pay initiative for Valsartan for hypertension in the U.S. and Denmark. Lilly launched a no-cure, no-pay for uh, Dalafil for erectile dysfunction in the United States. Patients who were not satisfied with the treatment were issued a voucher for the oral treatment of their choice. I'm not kidding you. That is what the uh, guarantee said. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Bayer launched in 2005 a no cure, no pay initiative on uh, Ardenafil, also for erectile dysfunction uh, in Denmark. And Muldrow, uh, in this reading, uh, advocates for this idea, and picking up on what Amelia just asked for, suggests a way of evaluating good circumstances for this. So, which are, where are good way, good circumstances in which we might think about this policy to enhance uh, public health and align incentives and increase quality? First of all, you want simple methods that can be used to measure the effect. For example, blood tests or obvious uh, symptoms of schizophrenia or erectile dysfunction. Um, second, the patient or general practitioner should be able to see the uh, effects for themselves. You know, uh, infections or baldness or something that they can see without complicated uh, tests. I don't think this idea is very likely to be implemented on any meaningful scale, but I do think it's very rational, and I actually think it would work. Plus, it's provocative to think about it, as was asked in the back, to begin to think about some of the failures, some of the circumstances in which something like this might be a problem. And in fact, it raises other questions, like if we were to do this, how would we determine the efficacy? And who would get to decide? Who decides if the drug is working? And what is efficacy anyway? What does it mean for a drug to work or a treatment to work? And how do patients determine efficacy nowadays at all? All interesting and difficult questions. And maybe there are elements, in fact, to this idea, uh, such as paying for quality of care, that actually would be worth implementing. Maybe we should pay more for better quality care than we pay for less quality care. Now, the importance of this issue, of who gets to decide and what matters, was highlighted and exploited by an analysis conducted by economist Thomas Phillipson in a very clever way, uh, studying the results of a large number of clinical trials. So right now, when doctors do clinical trials, I'm a doctor, I want to do a clinical trial. I take you half, and I randomly assign you to get the drug. And I take the other half, and I give you the control treatment. And then I measure something that I think is important. Like I put you in a CT scanner and measure how big the tumor is in you. Or I, uh, I conduct some blood tests that I see, and then I say, oh, the drug works. And I declare that the drug works, OK? Now, what's the incentive for me to get that judgment right? What's in it for me to correctly judge that the, uh, that the treatment worked. Why do, I, what, why do I, Nicholas, get rewarded if I correctly figure it out? Or how do I get rewarded? Yeah. So like the companies that are giving me the drug? Or the doctor doing the trial, yeah. So I'm the doctor doing the trial, I'm doing an experiment, I'm gonna randomly assign half and half, 
What's, why should I want to correctly discern? Like, what happens if I fail to detect a difference between the drug and the control? Or I wrongly conclude that the drug works and the control doesn't work? What's the downside for me? You're ineffectively treating your patients. I might be ineffectively treating my patients, or I might get a terrible reputation as a scientist, or I might not make it get paid because I'm doing I'm lousy at conducting the trial. Those are my incentives. Okay? Now look at it from the point of view of the patients in the trial. Who saw the Dallas Buyers Club, for example? Yeah? Look at it from the other side when you're now the patient. What's and you're trying to discern whether the drug is working or not. What's on, the, what's on the line for you if you're the patient? Your life. Your life, okay? Who do you think has a more powerful incentive to determine if the drug is working? The doctor or the patient? The patient. The patient. Very simple economic idea. So Philipson says, I'd like to know what patients think about whether drugs work in trials or not. And how do you tell if a drug works in, uh, in a trial of your patients? You can look at the dropout rate in the two arms of the study. You guys get randomly assigned to the drug, and you guys get randomly assigned to the control group, and you guys over here, 50% of you drop out. You say, I'm taking this toxic drug. Frankly, it's not worth it to me, right? All you know is that you're getting the drug and you're judging whether it's worth it to you or not. And you guys over here, 10% of you drop out. We would conclude that in the opinion of the patients in the trial, the drug wasn't working because the dropout rate was higher in the treatment arm than in the control arm. So Philipson does the following thing. He looks at a set of hundreds of clinical trials of drugs, and he says, what did these scientists conclude based on their outcome, that the drug works or that it doesn't work? And what did the patients conclude based on the dropout rate across the two arms? And he says, we can only believe trials in which the drugs, the patients and the doctors have the same opinion, the diagonal elements. But what do we do when the physicians say, oh, that's a great drug, it works, but the patients are dropping out in droves from that drug, that arm of the study. It says, you know, maybe the drug doesn't actually work after all. Another idea beyond paying for care or paying for quality to improve medical care is to pass more laws regulating the actual practice of medicine or patients' interactions with the healthcare system. So we're just going to hopscotch now through a few ideas. So another idea is let's use laws and legislation to make things better. The key idea here is that laws might be used to affect health and health care. And we've seen some examples of this in the domain of tobacco and seatbelt use earlier in the class. And the issues are different, of course, when we are trying to legislate a certain kind of behavior in doctors rather than patients or lay people. But such laws are very rare that require that doctors behave in certain ways. But there are some examples, for example, mammogram reporting. Well before you guys were born, it was an enormous problem of women getting mammograms, which incidentally has since shown, been shown probably to be useless, but that's another topic. Uh, women would be getting mammograms, and the doctors would be telling them the test results. So women had tumors in their breasts, the women later would get sick, the doctor had just forgotten, too busy, not told the woman about the test results. So a law was passed to really standardize and oblige reporting mammogram results. There is uh, advanced directive counseling, there's specific laws about this as well, and so forth. Um, and there are also laws that uh, cover the practice of research, of course, clinical uh, research. Here are some examples uh, of laws that we, that we uh, now direct at patients. Uh, childhood vaccination, uh, reporting of mammography, reporting of infectious diseases to authorities. If any of you ever had whooping cough in high school or if you ever had a venereal disease, you were reported to the public health authorities. Um, or information provision in the form of advanced directives or breast cancer or treatment options. So doctors are required to talk to women with breast cancer about their options in very specific ways. So this is a complicated area given long-standing concerns, justifiable in my opinion, uh, with preserving physician professionalism, because here I'm not sure how much we want the state involved in telling doctors what to do, because in some sense we want the doctors to feel moral responsibility and we want them to exercise judgment and discretion, and we don't want to bureaucratize that. But on the other hand, we do want them to do the right thing. So it's a difficult balance to strike how you legislate uh, the practice of medicine. And this issue is, the issue in this particular example shown here is whether women with breast cancer get full mastectomies or equally acceptable lumpectomy with radiation and chemotherapy. So the standard of care used to be a woman had a breast tumor, you would basically remove the breast and do what is known as a radical mastectomy, 
uh, sometimes taking out part of the muscle uh, on, the, on the chest wall and going up and dissecting the axillary lymph nodes and, and taking them out as well. Sometimes when you did that, you would damage the lymphatic drainage of the arm and the woman's arm would become very swollen for the rest of her life. Sometimes you would damage the nerves. Even it could be a serious problem. Instead, maybe you just take out the lung and radiate the woman's breast. It's equally effective. Uh, so the question was, if we pass a law that requires the doctors to talk to people, women, about these options, what happens to their relative choice between the two? And out of concern that women were not being given adequate information, several states passed laws in the 1980s to require physicians to inform patients, either orally or in writing or both, about treatment options in breast cancer. And this slide shows some of the effects of legislation on breast conserving surgery the lumpectomy and radiation compared to the radical mastectomy uh, in different places where a law was passed. So here's Detroit. Uh, here's what's happening in terms of breast conserving surgery. The law is passed, and, uh, and the rate of breast conserving surgery, uh, breast conserving surgery uh, is, uh, here's the predicted rate, and here it goes up. The breast conserving <coughs> surgery rates go up, these little asterisks there, after the law is passed. Here the law is passed, and you have a big blip up afterwards of breast conserving surgery. Here the same thing, a blip up compared to the predicted line, the sort of smoothed average uh, shown here in the, in, the, in the line. And here another law in Mexico <coughs> passed, and also you have a blip up, although in the last week, so maybe it's not statistically significant in New Mexico. And there are several observations uh, that enhance our confidence that it was the law that increased women's preference for breast conserving surgery. First, there was a uh, variation in where the bump occurred, uh, and it was always after the law was passed, and it didn't matter you know, where it was in time. Uh, it wasn't like around the country, and this month, everyone started getting more breast conserving surgery. Uh, but it's also noteworthy that, at least in this example, the effect of the law was transient. After a while, even after this initial flip up, the kind of return to the baseline rates. So there's a kind of temporary flip up and then you get the kind of baseline, a return to baseline, unfortunately. So the law had an effect, but it was brief in duration. Um, and making information more widely available is another possibly low-cost way of improving health. And the internet is doing just that. And as a result, it's leading to radical changes in the doctor-patient relationship. So one thing that many people are exploring in your generation are apps and online wikis and other kinds of ways that empower patients to have the information they need. Often this doesn't cost a lot of money, and this can be very effective in changing the quality and nature of care that people get. So 40% um, so of people with internet access use it to get health information. It's one of the most common searches, actually. 48% of those with chronic illness feel the internet can be used to improve their understanding. This number is rising. 27% of those with chronic illness felt that the internet was used uh, to use to improve their ability to manage their conditions by themselves. And as I already mentioned, there are many new online patient sites, wikis, and, uh, and so forth. And in fact, uh, patients come into the office nowadays, to physicians' offices, with more and more knowledge. They can gather experiences and interact with other patients from all over the world. They can get non-medical perspectives on their treatments and second-guess their doctors. And they can band together and advocate politically to change practice. Uh, actually, in some ways, it's very sort of um, sobering as a doctor when the patient comes in and knows so much about their condition and you no longer have the sole source of power. But in other ways, you can take the conversation to the next level because they come in already educated. You don't need to talk to them about uh, the basics. And in some ways, the internet will help us realize the vision articulated by Illich many lectures ago of putting health and health information in the hands of the people. Remember, Illich was very concerned about elite control and professionalization of medical knowledge. And the internet, in some ways, might help level that playing field, making people uh, as important as doctors in the management of their own conditions. Other policies we might implement might direct themselves to patients rather than to doctors, and might be preventative rather than curative in nature. Here's one of my favorite and simplest examples taken from your readings. The investigators here simply placed signs in a large mall and then watched how they affected nearly 18,000 shoppers over the course of three months. And the sign said, your heart needs exercise, use the stairs, or improve your waistline, use the stairs. So they put these signs in, here's the health benefit sign, the weight control sign, 
And then they looked, they, they, they hid in a hive, and they looked at where, whether patients were using the escalator or not. And they found that at baseline, 4.8% of the people used the stairs. Uh, most people used the escalator. But with the health benefit sign, this increased to 6.9%. Uh, and the weight control sign, 7.2%. Uh, and there were differences by race and weight class and sex and age in the likelihood of people using the stairs in response to the sign. And in some ways, these results are actually too good to be true. Think about the cost effectiveness of this. If every sign and easel cost about 60 bucks, it would cost less than $200,000 to place a sign at every single regional mall in the United States. Then if only 4% of shoppers use the stairs in each of these malls, 4%. Roughly 1.6 million or more Americans would take the stairs each day than before. And the caloric cost of walking up and down two flights of stairs each day, which is about five calories per, slide, per flight, would amount to a weight loss of up to five pounds for an average man over the course of a year. So you spend $200,000, potentially, to modify the built environment, make a structural change, a very subtle one, and potentially have a big effect on what happens with people. And this is an example of nudging, this one I just showed you, advocated by Thaler, by Cass uh, Sunstein and Richard Thaler, uh, and others, based on basic psychological principles. Nudges are simple changes in structure that affect agency in likely paternalistic ways. And they are often very ingenious. So here's an example of a nudge, a very effective way of uh, painting the crosswalk, taking advantage of perspective. This is what it actually looks like from the side. You can see the Snoopy and other characters laid out like this, but as you approach the crosswalk, it looks like these cartoon characters are crossing. So you slow down, right? You reduce injuries, you reduce the speed. Very light touch, very subtle, kind of witty thing that you might do. Nudges are not new. Here's a nudge from when Napoleon was in power. This is a chamber pot that you're supposed to piss into. And obviously the people here didn't like Napoleon and they wanted to change attitudes about Napoleon. So they forced you to look at him while you piss on him, uh, you know, every day. Okay? This is an old style nudge taken from quite some uh, time ago. You can piss on the emperor's head. Um, or here's a nudge from World War II. This is not so subtle. This was an advertising for an uh, atomarine, which was an anti-malarial drug, uh, drug. This was in Papua New Guinea. Uh, and these men didn't take uh, their ivory, uh, and they're the skulls of the ostensibly of the men who weren't complying. But that's a little bit more powerful, not more powerful, but uh, more dramatic nudge than the ones that we just saw. And here's one that was making the rounds of the internet. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, you need to think through these nudges carefully to avoid unintended side effects. So they distributed uh, pencils that said, too cool uh, to do drugs, and a 10-year-old boy noticed that Actually, when you begin to shake down this pencil, it said, cool to do drugs, do drugs, or just drugs, uh, it's the pencil. So you can distribute lots of these pencils, but the majority of them are giving the wrong message, not the nudge that you intend uh, when, you, uh, when you distribute it. Uh, so you need to think quite carefully when you, uh, when you design these uh, kinds of nudges. They can have unintended uh, effects. And here's an inventive example. Some of you may have seen this one, I don't know, from Sweden. Similar intent, similar in intent to the placards at malls. Uh, take a look at this.
by Volkswagen, but nevertheless, it's very inventive uh, and, very, and very creative. So that's another example of a kind of a public policy that we could uh, implement. And here's an example of how the built environment can actually be ridiculous. Uh, you know, people are taking the escalator up to the fitness center. It doesn't make much sense uh, at all. What? But okay, so now as we saw earlier, even a slight increase or decrease in the average caloric intake or energy expenditure can have huge population level effects. This figure is taken from a few lectures ago, and it shows that the median of the distribution of estimated energy accumulation that accounts for the observed weight gain of about two pounds per year in Americans 20 to 40 years old is only in excess of 15 kilocalories per day, or the flight of stairs we just discussed. So if every American just took one extra flight per day, that could comment on average the weight gain that we are seeing, or consume half a candy bar less. But this must sound too optimistic, as people might first eventually adapt to the signs or come to ignore them, just like they do with cigarette labels. So maybe you know, initially it's really cool to have the, the piano stairs, but after a while people say, I've already done that once, and I'll take the escalator. So you, know, you have to be endlessly invented to actually keep people engaged in these kinds of things. Instead of paying doctors, another idea might be we should pay patients. Uh, this is from your readings. A $750 incentive is both very effective and highly cost efficient, as you saw in your readings. So this shows paying patients to quit smoking. This was a randomized controlled trial. The incentive group was over three times more likely to quit compared to the control group, uh, and uh, just by giving them an extra $750 in this RCT of smoking uh, cessation. And in the case of smoking, we've used much more than mere signs. Uh, as we've discussed, we've looked at labels on cigarette packs, excise taxes, clean air laws, laws against the sale to minors, advertising restrictions, and counter-marketing and social movement campaigns. And maybe a similarly broad effort is needed for other sorts of health problems we're facing in our society. But perhaps some policies, in fact, could uh, approximate the removal of the handle on the Broad Street pump. So radically affected structure that they can actually cure the condition. Maybe we can begin to find such analogous handles for certain other kinds of problems that we have been facing. And so if we are serious about improving health, we must see that increasing uh, access to and use of medical care, however commendable a goal that is for pragmatic or moral reasons, is not the same thing as health promotion. So if we really want to fix health, it's not enough, or even the big step to give people health insurance, or even a big step to give them health care. Actually, we need to think about health and health delivery in a completely different way. So you need to understand that medical care, when you think about medical care and health promotion, medical care is not the same thing as health improvement. And our system does poorly when health and medicine differ. And a better system would pay for health improvement rather than service provision. Just providing care is not really what we want for our money. And the current system does not pay for many things of great value. This, again, is a problem of underinvestment in public goods, the problem that we saw a few lectures ago. Any questions? OK. Oh, yes. No, I'm Come and see me. See you next time.